everyone, uh, welcome back to Crafting a Life I Want. Today on the channel, I'm going to be making a leather sheath for the knife that I just uh, finished up for my brother. Uh, I really need to get this in the mail and get it to him as soon as possible. So hopefully today will be a quick one day build and I'll try to talk through what I'm doing uh, on camera as much as possible. Uh, thanks for watching and I hope you'll like and subscribe below. So I lay out my pattern on the leather, paying attention to which side is smooth and how it's going to fold in a reference to the belt loop. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear my, uh, my munchkin in the background, but um, he is asking for my help. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, go out and help him, and then I'll come right back and finish up this cutting. All right, I'm back. For those of you that have four-year-olds, I'm sure you can uh, can imagine how hard it is to get some uh, quiet, peaceful time in the house. That's usually why I'm out in the shop, but it's cold in my shop and my wife is elsewhere today. So we are in the back studio trying to get some work done. So this is a neck knife uh, that um, Dustin of the Art of Craftsmanship made for me. I actually really like it for uh, cutting leather. I'm not uh, convinced I like the thickness of this belt loop. Um, I might narrow that out a little bit uh, when the time comes. So I just measured and drew three lines down the middle of my sheath. I'm doing this so that I can uh, cut three grooves in that area. This is right where the sheath is going to fold and these grooves will uh, remove some of the leather and allow it to make that radius around the blade a lot smoother. So my next step is to uh, narrow out the belt loop and I'm doing this by squaring off the belt loop from the top of the sheath and I'm also going to take this as an opportunity to radius the corners between the belt loop and the sheath itself, which will allow a smoother transition into the body of the sheath. So now that the belt loop is taken care of, I'm taking steps to cut out my welt for this sheath. One of the things that I pay attention to when I'm both designing a knife handle as well as the sheath that it goes in is I like to have a thicker portion of the handle towards the front on the blade side and then a thinner portion just behind it. This allows me to have the knife sit in the sheath just past that thicker portion which then allows me to wet mold the leather sheath around that thinner portion which then securely holds the blade and keeps it from falling out when it's turned upside down. So I finished shaping the welt and now I am shaping the end of the belt loop and skiving it so it's a little thinner which will allow the stitches and the sheath itself to lay a little flatter against your hip. All right, got the die and a dauber to go ahead and put it on. I'm using dark brown leather dye uh, that I get from Tandy Leather. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, turns out that's the last time that I'll be doing dye work on my wife's uh, fabric cutting mat. But I just spent the last 10 minutes cleaning it up, making sure there was no trace of dye on it. This is my first time using beeswax as a burnishing agent and I am exceptionally happy with how it turned out. I get nice glossy edges with all of the little bits of leather tamped down with minimal effort as compared to something like water. Now that the hard to reach edges are dyed and burnished, I'm going to go ahead and prep the belt loop for stitching. I wet the fold, fold it over, use a little bit of rubber cement to glue it in place, mark out the holes, and then I'm going to take it out to the drill press and drill them all the way through, and I will bring you all back in here to stitch it together.
All right, so we're back in from the shop, and one of the things I forgot to mention as far as prep work was concerned for stitching is that once the holes are drilled, I go ahead and take my groover and cut grooves where all the stitches are going to lay. This allows the stitches to lay at or beneath the surface of the leather, which reduces the amount of wear and tear that they take. The stitch I use for leather is called a saddle stitch, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later on when I do the stitching on the main body of the sheath. I really like using uh, the Dacron B50 for stitching uh, because I know it's exceptionally strong. And I've tried using uh, wax linen thread in the past. Um, the type of stuff in varying thicknesses that my wife used for bookmaking and ran into more times than not that when I was attempting to uh, tighten up the stitches that that wax linen thread would break. And so after that happening a couple times, I just decided that Dacron works for me. There's obviously a lot of other choices um, that you can use. I'm sure a lot of people uh, use things like artificial sinew or um, other types of uh, wax thread that works perfectly fine for them, but this works for me and is something I almost always have around uh, considering I make bowstrings and uh, other type stuff. So that wax works so well to burnish the exterior edges that I've done so far, I want to take a minute to go ahead and seal up the inside a little bit. This will tamp down all of the loose fibers that are inside as well as seal it a little bit with the wax against any uh, water or any other foreign objects that might get in there. Man, I feel like I have been ready to glue up on this at least three or four times, but I think I'm actually ready to glue up at this point. So one of the things you'll notice when you cut out a welt is that one side of the welt is smooth, the other side is rough. So the first thing you wanna do is scrape up that smooth side. This just gives something for the glue to adhere to and allow it to uh, stick better when you do the glue up. So I'm still using rubber cement, apply it liberally, stick the pieces together, and hope they don't come apart when you start drilling. With that first glue up dry, I go ahead and remove the clamps and start prepping for the final glue up and the fold of the leather. I wet the seam. This just allows it to fold a little more uh, smoothly through the turn and will hold that shape once it dries. Uh, and then I just go ahead and again apply liberal amounts of rubber cement and then clamp it gently to avoid uh, marking the leather and let it dry.
right, so the glue's dried. I'm gonna go ahead and pop the clamps off, take a quick look. Looking pretty good. I'm gonna take it out to the grinder and we'll clean up some of these edges, uh, get some of this stuff to line up a little better, and then I will go ahead and do the stitching. But the grinder first, and I'll get you guys set up out there to watch. <clears throat> Here's where I'm at after grinding. The edges don't look quite as good as I wanted because when I did the fold over, my back side stuck out a little farther than my front side. And so once I completed sanding and flushing out the edges, the chamfer that we put on uh, the back side is gone where the chamfer on the front side is relatively uneven. So I'm gonna go back through and recut that chamfer on the back and on the front side, and I'll go ahead and dye. Uh, dye these all the same color as the rest of it. Um, I'll do that at the same time as I'm, I, I run my, uh, my line for stitching and get those holes laid out. But it's still really cold in my shop, so I'm gonna go back inside to do some of that, and I will bring you into that. So the bevels are all cleaned up. It doesn't quite look it because the dye is uneven. And then just like that, they are dyed and burnished. Now I'm going to go ahead and start cutting the grooves for the stitching. As I finish up cutting these grooves, I'm then going to go back and dye the areas that we just cut, and then I will take an awl and mark my points of interest, which are the corners, the ends, as well as where the two lines meet, and then I'm going to evenly space out my holes between those points of interest, making sure that uh, I use relatively the same spacing throughout. I tend to focus on about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little under. Um, and then once that's done, I'm going to take you guys out to the drill press and I'll work there. I'm really happy with how this turned out. As you can see on the back side, all of our holes are in a nice even line. And I will take you guys inside and I'll cut this, the groove in those holes, follow them along, and then I'll get started on stitching. Man, cutting the groove in the backside was causing me some problems. I think what ended up happening is that my groove cutter was clogged, and so I had to clean it out before it would give the waste for the cuts somewhere to go. I did get some rough cuts in there, but I think the stitching will uh, make it so that nobody can even tell that those rough cuts are there. So I'm going to go ahead and finish dyeing, and then I will uh, start stitching it. starting here and then I'm going to go up over down and then finish down at the bottom. All right so when I'm doing this final stitching uh, I'm gonna make sure I pull off a bunch just to make sure I have plenty because the last thing you want to do is to not have enough thread and have to pull all the stitches out and start over again because with a saddle stitch um, there is no uh, adding on you can't, certainly can't lengthen it and so I am pulling off a good deal, uh, probably roughly around six feet, just to make sure I have enough. I promised you earlier in the video more detail on what a saddle stitch was, and so here it goes. 
Basically what a saddle stitch is, is you take one piece of thread, in this case it's about six feet long, and I have needles on both ends. And then I choose my starting point, which you saw a couple minutes ago, and I take one needle, I put it through that hole, and then I even out the thread on both sides. Once that's done, each subsequent hole is going to have both needles going through each hole um, every time. So I'll take one needle, I'll put it through the hole, and then I'll take the other needle on the other side and put it the opposite way through the hole, basically creating a square of thread that holds the leather together. I'm able to pull this tight at every step, and then I work my way up, over, down. Once I get all the way to the bottom, I then come back up three stitches, so I'm doubling over the stitches in those areas. I tend to need a pair of pliers to pull my needles through because the holes aren't very big, but once you get done with those three stitches, um, I go ahead and trim my ends, usually around two-eighths of an inch or a uh, sorry, a quarter of an inch, and then I burn them. And because it's a waxed uh, polyester linen thread, um, I, I actually don't have any idea what the Dacron B50 is made out of. I, I couldn't find any information on it. I do know it's waxed. Um, but once you burn it in and kind of press it into the hole that it's in, it kind of melts and fuses together, and that will be more than enough uh, to keep any of the stitching from coming undone. really happy with how the stitching turned out. The contrast between the dark leather and the bright gold of the Dacron B50 is great. The spacing on the holes looks really good. I'm really excited to see the, the final finished product of this sheath. Uh, the next steps are wet molding around the knife and then I'm going to do final treatment of the leather uh, before I send this off to my brother. So it turns out, I don't have the ability to speak on camera without saying we, us, but there's no, there's nobody else helping me with this. All it is is me. I don't even have a cameraman. All my camera stuff is set up on tripods or in my hands, things like that. Anyways, the whole point of this was to uh, record direct to video and not have to redo the audio, but that didn't work. So I'm going to have to bear with me a little bit as I kind of... Uh, go over this again, and if you see my mouth and it's not exactly lined with what I'm saying, I apologize. Anyways, I suppose I should get back to telling you what I'm actually doing with this wet molding. So the first step here is to coat the entire knife in oil. You want to make sure you fill all the nooks and crannies of the rasp knife as well as coat the handle, uh, the area that um, we filed on the back of the spine. Just make sure everything is coated in oil. This will help keep anything from rusting or any moisture from getting to the blade. I do suppose that the best part of me having to do a voiceover is that I get to cut out all of the extra video that I apparently talk slowly through. Like, for example, this takes me about five to ten minutes to finish wrapping this knife in saran wrap and get it ready for wet molding. But 
Anyways, uh, that is what I'm doing here. Um, you want to make sure the saran wrap is tight around the blade. You don't want it taking up so much space that it messes with the positions that we want the leather in. Make sure that the transition between blade and handle is uh, sharp. Again, for the same reasons, we're trying to wet mold the leather as tight as possible to the blade, and if there's too much plastic in any one spot, um, it, will, it, it will get in the way of trying to force the leather into that position. The next step we do is wet the leather to prep it for molding around the knife. Uh, one thing I can say is do not grab the sponge off of your kitchen counter. No matter how many times you rinse it, there's still soap in it, which is what I'm discovering right now. There is still soap in the sponge. So I swap over to just a, a clean white rag um, and use that to uh, get my leather nice and wet. You want to make sure you wet the exterior, uh, particularly the area up around where the handle is inside the uh, leather, because this is the part that will be going through the most stretching. Wet the front, the back, the inside. Um, some people, and I, I've done this before as well, um, some people will just dip their entire sheath into the bowl of water. Uh, I didn't think that was entirely necessary, so I went with the option of just uh, wiping it on with a wet rag, but that's, you know, that, that works. It makes it easy. There's just a lot of moisture. Uh, the first knife I did ended up rusting pretty significantly when it was wet molding, which is why I'm taking uh, so many extra precautions uh, for this one. And one of those precautions was not saturating uh, the handle or the, the sheath. As you can see, the next step is put the knife in the sheath. Once that's done and seated properly, I start paying attention to where I want the leather to mold around the knife. I pay very close attention to the area around the handle, particularly the top of the sheath. This area is around a narrower section of the handle, and if I get this molded correctly, once we're all done, the knife will actually have an audible click, for lack of a better word, as it slides in and out. It will hold the knife very securely and it will keep it from falling out even if shaken upside down um, without having any additional strapping or like a snap ring around it. Uh, this, is, this is why I do a good deal of wet molding is that it allows me to have a more sleek looking sheath and still hold the knife very securely. And don't be afraid to use some force on this. You're physically stretching out leather. So feel free to press down hard with your thumbs. Don't use any tools or you will mark up your leather. I've done that before and it's not fun. Um, but it, again, use a lot of pressure. Stretch out what you need. Press in where you need it. Uh, feel free to add more water during this process. Uh, another thing you want to pay attention to is that the, the back of the sheath, where the belt loop is, you want to try to keep that relatively flat. So you'll notice I'm doing all of my molding from the top. That's because that's the area I want to stretch out and I want to keep the back relatively flat. All right, should be good. If you take a look here, you can see the indent that we've made here. You can kind of see where that front curve is on the handle. It kind of comes in like this. And then uh, you can see on the back how we've kept this section relatively flat. And so I am going to leave this just like this overnight. And I'll bring you back tomorrow for uh, pulling this out, showing you how it holds its form. And then we will, or then I will, um, uh, do the final conditioning on this. Well, I thought I was done doing a voiceover for this video, but apparently not. All right, so the next day, let's take a look at the forming and see how I did. I managed to keep the back relatively flat. I kept a lot of the details in around the handle, which is what we're looking for. Now I'm going to take uh, some time to unwrap the knife, uh, wipe all the extra oil off of it, and then I will uh, come back and do a test fit. Now comes our test fit. Oh, that's beautiful. I don't know if you can hear it, but when we slide it in, it slides in easy. And then right at the end where we molded that around uh, the slightly narrow section, it just kind of clicks past it. 
and then doesn't come out, that's great. All right, so the next thing that I'm gonna do, which is the last thing that we're gonna do, is go ahead and treat the leather. Uh, a lot of people use uh, Neat's Foot Oil, which I have used in the past and have had a decent amount of success with it. Um, I did come across this other leather conditioner that I've been using since I was uh, playing soccer in college. It's called Chelsea Leather Food. And I have uh, started using this in a lot of my leather stuff and I really enjoy uh, the finish it gives. So we're just going to, this is, it's, it's a collection, I couldn't find details on exactly what it's made out of, but it's basically a collection of oil and wax um, that allows you to buff up uh, your leathers. So we're just going to go ahead and liberally apply this on. And because uh, the dyeing process and certainly the wetting process um, tends to dry out leather, you want to you wanna be fairly liberal um, when you're applying this conditioner. All right, this is looking fantastic. I'm loving the color that we got in that, particularly how it contrasts with that golden... Uh, Dacron B50 we use for our stitching. I am really excited uh, with how, how well this came out. So it's been a couple of hours. Um, I did apply one more coat and then I came back with just uh, a white rag and buffed it up. And you can see just how beautiful that shine is. everyone and that's a wrap on our bushcraft knife sheath. I am really happy with how it turned out. Some of the new processes we used worked great, specifically the beeswax as my burnishing agent. The finish on it is beautiful. It's nice. I was able to use that uh, that Chelsea leather food and shine it up uh, really nice. The coloring came out great. The stitching contrasting with it. I just I'm really happy with everything uh, about this sheath. The uh, the wet molding went fantastic and the knife fits in great. Um, if you haven't already, uh, I'll link my knife making video in the comments below. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for watching. I certainly do appreciate it. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe um, and let me know what you think about uh, some of the new processes I used in the comments below. Thanks again for watching.